the stories of mahabharata retold by sudipta bhaumik welcome dear friends to another episode of the stories of mahabharata in the last episode we heard how arjuna rescued the five apsaras from their curse we also heard how he married subhadra sister of lord krishna and returned to indraprastha from his exile one day krishna and arjuna along with their friends and family went on a trip to the banks of the river yamuna near the kandava forest while the women and children were swimming and playing in the river and having a great time krishna and arjuna slowly walked to the edge of the forest they sat down under the shade of a tree and discussed various matters of interest just then a brahmin appeared in front of them from his looks it was quite evident that this huge statured man was no ordinary brahmin his skin glowed like molten gold his copper hued beard flowed down to his chest and locks of knotted hair fluttered in the breeze he stood in front of krishna and arjuna and said i am agni the god of fire i seek your help krishna and arjuna stood up with folded palms arjuna said o oh lord of fire it will be an honor to help you please tell what would you want us to do agni said i want to devour this kind of a forest help me to do so surprised by this unusual request krishna asked lord why would you want to devour this forest and if you want to devour it you can do so at any moment why would you need our help agni said krishna i am suffering from anorexia king swetaki has been conducting a fire sacrifice for 12 long years and all these years the king kept on feeding me pure ghee without any break consuming that huge amount of ghee has caused this lack of appetite in me i asked lord brahma for a cure he laughed and said go and burn down the kandava forest and eat the flesh and fat of the creatures living there you will be cured of your illness but each time i tried lord indra would extinguish me by pouring torrential rains to protect his friend lord indra's friend who's he asked arjuna agni said he is a serpent named takshaka indra would never let me burn down takshaka's home and kill him but if i don't consume this forest i won't be cured of my illness so please help by stopping indra from extinguishing me while i devour the kandava forest arjuna said we can help you but we don't have the weapons suitable to fight lord indra krishna is also unarmed agni thought for a while and then said let me make arrangements for your weapons he summoned varuna the god of the oceans and asked for some special weapons for arjuna and krishna varuna brought gandiva the great bow made from the spine of a rhino and studded with jewels and offered it to arjuna along with the bow he gave arjuna a pair of quivers which had an endless supply of arrows agni also gave arjuna a grand chariot named kapidhwaja driven by four powerful white steeds krishna received a huge mace named kaumadiki and a spinning disc named sudarshan chakra that could sever anything at the command of the owner Arjuna said, "O Lord Agni, we are now well prepared to defend you from any obstacle. 
you may begin to devour the Kandava forest. Agni said, I will, but make sure that I can consume all the living creatures in this forest. Let no one escape my wrath. Agni then lit up in a huge blaze and began to burn the forest. Arjuna and Krishna rode the divine Kapidhwaja chariot and began circling the forest. As the fire raged through the huge trees and thick foliage, the animals and birds ran for their lives. But as they tried to escape, Arjuna's arrows stopped them on their tracks while the fire roasted them to their death. The ponds and lakes in the forest began to boil in the tremendous heat, killing all fish and other amphibious creatures in them. The death cries and roars of the animals merged with the loud crackling sound of the burning forest brought fears into the hearts of men and women living miles away. The towering inferno touched the sky and the gods in heaven became worried about the consequences. They went to King Indra and said, Lord, aren't you aware of what Agni is doing to the Kandava forest? If he continues for long, no creature in the forest would stay alive. You must do something to stop him. Hindra said, Don't worry. I will stop Agni. We cannot let him burn down everything he wants. He commanded the rains to pour on the Khandava forest. But the heat of the burning forest evaporated the water before it could reach the trees. Indra was furious. He attacked Arjuna from the heavens with his thunderbolt and other weapons. The gods, the asuras, the gandharvas all joined Indra to fight Krishna and Arjuna. But Arjuna's arrows and Krishna's chakra defeated them all. Indra then lifted a huge peak of the Mandara mountain and hurled it towards Arjuna. Arjuna's arrows broke the mountain into thousands of pieces which rained on the forest and killed many more animals. Arjuna's skills impressed Indra. As a father, he felt quite proud. But still, he kept on fighting to stop Agni from destroying the forest and kill his friend Takshaka. At that moment, a voice rang out from the heavens. Indra, Indra, Give up your fight with Arjuna and Krishna. Nobody can defeat them in war. They are the reincarnations of the gods, Nara and Narayana. And don't worry about your friend Takshaka. He's safe in Kurukshetra. Hearing this, Indra gave up his fight, congratulated Arjuna for his gallantry, and went back to the heavens. An Asura named Maya used to live in that forest. When he tried to escape the fire, Krishna saw him. Just when Krishna was about to hurl his Sudarshana Chakra to kill Maya, the giant threw himself at the feet of Arjuna and cried, O oh Prince, I am Maya, the Asura. I have never harmed anyone in my life. Please save me from Krishna's Chakra. Arjuna felt pity on this gentle giant. He asked Krishna, Friend, this man has surrendered and is begging for his life. Please spare him. Krishna retracted his chakra and said, How can I ever deny your wish, Partha? Maya, you are spared. The fire raged for 15 days, killing all creatures living in the forest. Agni consumed his herd's content of fat and flesh of the animals and birds in the forest and was cured of his disease. He said to Krishna and Arjuna, Thank you for curing my illness. I am pleased with your service. You may now go back to your picnic and take some rest. Arjuna and Krishna then went back to the bank of the Yamuna river. Mayasura followed them. When Krishna and Arjuna sat down by the riverside, Maya stood in front of them with folded palms and said, Arjuna, you have saved me from the wrath of Agni and from the disgust of Krishna. Please, please let me know how can I pay you back. Arjuna smiled and said, 
you don't have to pay back anything you may go now but maya was adamant he said just as vishwakarma is the chief architect and craftsman of the gods i am of the asuras it will be an honor for me if you let me build something for you arjuna said thank you for your offer but as i have saved your life i cannot accept any favors from you in return but i don't want to desert in you either why don't you do something for krishna that will make me happy maya asked krishna what can he build for him krishna thought for a while and then said if you'd like to do something for us i'd like to request you to build an assembly hall for king yudhishthira a magnificent assembly hall that is one of a kind and has no comparables in heaven or earth maya agreed in 14 months maya built a grand assembly hall that was nothing less than an architectural marvel it was a magical palace built with crystals and marbles and decorated with finest of jewels paintings and drapery the hallways merged into the flower gardens and lakes in a wonderful blend of nature and architecture transparent crystal floors decorated with lotus blossoms were often mistaken as real pools while the crystal clear still waters of built-in pools looked like dry marble floor people mistook the clear crystal waters as doorways and doorways as walls it was a palace of illusions and visitors who were not aware were often fooled by maya's designs the hall was guarded by 8000 ferocious demons named kinkaras whom maya had brought from the mountains when the assembly hall was completed yudhishthira made arrangements to inaugurate the hall on an auspicious day he invited 10000 brahmins and treated them with delicious meals of rice meat and sweets and gave them precious gifts like gold and silver jewelry expensive clothing and thousands of cattle the brahmins praised yudhishthira for his generosity then with great pomp and fanfare yudhishthira ascended the throne of the assembly hall they invited kings and royalties they invited brahmins all broke out in a huge applause they sang the praise of the great pandava king yudhishthira while the royal band played joyful music few days later rishi narada along with his associates came to visit the pandavas and to see the new assembly hall yudhishthira and his brothers welcomed him with due respect and offered him generous gifts for gracing their palace narada then offered yudhishthira some advice on administration and governance he asked yudhishthira while you think of increasing the wealth of your kingdom do you also think of spiritual matters do you manage your time well and serve your duties towards justice and religion wealth and your family's needs with equal priority remember your palace and forts should always be stocked up with food water weapons guards and artisans do not give severe punishments to your citizens for then you will fall from their grace remember to make a smart courageous and loyal man your chief of the army always give your soldiers enough food to eat and pay their salary on time if an enemy asks for your shelter protect him like your own child do not forget to give a share of your wealth to your main warriors when you win wealth by conquering other kingdoms only spend a third or fourth of what you earn for yourself always demand that your accountants and clerks brief you daily in the morning you should build large reservoirs and canals such that your farmers do not have to depend on rain for their crops your farmers must always be provided with food seeds and loans at low interest you should always be polite and soft spoken with women but never tell them your secrets 
always treat the physically challenged the orphans and the poor like your own children shun the six most evil habits of a man unnecessary sleep laziness cowardice softness anger and procrastination yudhishthira bowed down to narada and said you have enriched me with your advice i will try to follow these principles to the best of my ability narada then said o king you have the power to conquer the world you have the support of your gallant brothers i advise you to perform the rajasuya fire sacrifice and declare yourself to be the emperor of the world this would make your ancestors especially your late father pandu proud of you saying so narada and his associates left the palace of indraprastha as per rishi narada's guidance yudhishthira continued his rule as the king of indraprastha he freed himself of any anger or pride and based his governance on the principle of dharma or righteousness the people of indraprastha looked upon yudhishthira as their father everybody loved yudhishthira and he earned the title of ajat shatru one who has no enemies but rishi narada's advice about performing the rajasuya sacrifice kept coming back to yudhishthira's mind again and again he knew that rajasuya sacrifice was no easy task it implied declaring himself as the emperor of the world so before he could even start the sacrificial ritual he would have to gain the allegiance of all the kings and rulers of the land if any of them declined to accept yudhishthira as his emperor it would mean war yudhishthira's ministers advisers and his brothers were all in support they said you deserve to be the emperor of the world and this is the best time in your life to perform the rajasuya sacrifice the sages and the priests also gave their consent yudhishthira said i am glad you think that i should perform the rajasuya sacrifice and declare myself the emperor but i wish to know what lord krishna has to say about this send a messenger to dwarka and invite krishna to visit indraprastha tell him i seek his counsel on this important matter no sooner krishna received the message he arrived in yudhishthira's palace after listening to the details of the proposal krishna said yudhishthira you well deserve to perform the rajasuya sacrifice and become the emperor of the world but before you decide i should warn you that your claim to the throne will not go unchallenged all the kings will accept you as their emperor except one the vicious king jarasandha he has terrorized many kings and have captured 86 of them once he captures 14 more he would sacrifice the kings to the goddess jarasandha happens to be the father of my uncle kansa's wife asti you know Kansa was also an evil king and he terrorized his people so i killed him asti asked her father jarasandha to take her revenge since then jarasandha has been trying to kill me we fought him for a while but he has such a huge army that we figured that we won't be able to destroy him even if we fought for 300 years that's why we fled mathura and went to the western shores Jarasandha knows that I am your cousin and friend he would never let you succeed in your rajasuya sacrifice so if you want to succeed you must kill him Bhima said if Krishna and Arjuna joins me we should be able to kill Jarasandha but Yudhishthira was scared he said Bhima and Arjuna are as dear to me as my two eyes you Krishna is my heart how can i risk your lives if anything happens to you i could never forgive myself it seems even yama the god of death can defeat yarasandha i think it would be prudent to give up any plans for rajasuya 
Arjuna stood up and said, I believe in strength and prefer to use it when needed. If you give up your plans for the sake of our safety, it will only express your weakness. If you want to live the life of a peace-loving ascetic, you may do so later. For now, be the emperor you deserve to be and let us fight for you. Krishna was happy to hear Arjuna's words. He said, Arjuna is right. I haven't heard of anybody gain immortality by staying away from war. But a clever man always avoids an all-out war against a powerful enemy. He tries to defeat him by other means. I think we should adopt the same policy against Jarasandha. We should enter our enemy's palace in disguise. And then, when he is alone, we would attack him and fulfill our mission. Our objective is to free our friends, the 86 kings from the dungeons of Jarasandha. So if we get killed by Jarasandha and fail to accomplish our mission, we would at least be assured a place in heaven for attempting this good deed. The Stories of Mahabharata is written, directed and told by Shudipta Bomek. Audio engineering, original music and sound design by Avi Ziv. The podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons non-commercial license. Find us online at facebook.com slash Mahabharata podcast. Join the group for updates and news. Subscribe to the podcast using iTunes or any podcast catcher.